want to welcome everybody here tonight to our ongoing study. Welcome those that will be watching later on on video. Uh, before we even start talking about anything, before I get people going, I'm just going to start us off with a word of prayer. I think that's always a great way to start. I'm so thankful for those of you that remind me. So let us go to the Lord. Most wonderful and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful for this day. Lord, thankful for the outpouring of your grace and your mercy in our lives. God, but the biggest thing we have to be thankful for tonight is for your holy word, the most surest and true way by which you reveal yourself to us. God, it is a beautiful love story that you poured out on these pages for us. We're so thankful for being able to partake in this story, Lord, to learn more about you and to figure out how to incorporate your story into our story. So God, as we study your word tonight, be with us and guide us, send the Holy Spirit to us, let it touch our minds so we understand what we're hearing and let it touch our hearts so that we, we treasure it up, Lord, and it finds good fertile soil. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. All right, so last week, uh, well, well, when we last saw David and company, um, they had just won a great battle uh, against his arch enemy, which just happened to be his own flesh and blood, his son Absalom. Um, who had overthrown him, ran him out of Jerusalem with his tail tucked between his legs, took over um, as king of Israel. Uh, he had chased his father to try to kill his father and his men. However, through it all, David had a love in his heart for his son. And, and boy, I tell you, if that is not... Um, reminiscent of God's love for us even when we're in open rebellion to him uh, David's last command to his commanders before they go out in the field to chase after Absalom's uh, army is do not lay a hand on my son for my sake don't harm him well somebody forgot to get the message and Absalom finds himself caught up by his head in a tree dangling helpless and he is run through and killed the news is brought back to David. That's where we finished up last week. The news is brought back to David. Hey, everything is well. The army's been defeated. He says, what about my boy? And the first guy kind of tap dancing around. He's like, oh, I don't really know how to say it. The second guy comes and says, everything's great. The army's been defeated. What about my boy? Well, let's just say this. I'm not going to say he's dead, King David, but may all your enemies go down that same path that your son Absalom is in. So David understands his son's dead. He goes into mourning, and that's how we left it last week. So we pick up this week in chapter 19 of 2 Samuel, uh, and everybody is rejoicing because of this great victory. Um, all of David's army is rejoicing because they have, uh, they have been victorious over uh, David's enemy. Everybody that is except for David. He is um, he's hiding upstairs crying his eyes out, well, guess what? His crying, his weeping for his son kind of brings everybody down and harshes their buzz. Everybody is on eggshells now. Like, how do we respond to this? I mean, we, this is supposed to be a joyful time, but man, the king's crying, so we can't really be dancing and hooping and hollering. And so they find themselves subdued. Well, word gets out to the uh, leader of the army, old Joab, and Joab's like, uh-uh, no. King David can't be doing this. I've got to go have a talk with him. And so he goes finds King David, uh, and, and, and he speaks a very harsh word, but a word that the king needs to hear. He starts off by like, you know what? These men have been out here working hard for you, and you're treating them like they're nothing. You're up here crying over Absalom um, while your men were the ones that was out saving you from your enemy. King, do I got to remind you that it was your very own son who was your enemy? Uh, he says... You need to get out there, and you need to thank them men for what they have done, or I promise you that by the time night falls, you are not going to have any men left. And this is going to be even worse than the situation we had with Absalom. So David gets up, and he says, okay, Joab, I guess you're right. He says, I'm still a little sad, but I'll go out here, and I'll pretend like everything's okay. So he gets up, he goes out and greets the men, and um, the men of Judah come and, um, and listen to what he has to say. Meanwhile, all the traitors from the nation of Israel, which is the other ten tribes, uh, they take off like uh, scared rabbits and go back home. Um, after that episode, uh, there's a little bit of argument about 
whether David should be reinstated as king or not uh, amongst the tribe of Judah. Uh, basically, the issue is, is man, when the chips, went, when the chips were down, this man took off. He left Jerusalem, abandoned us, and took off. Um, should we reinstate him as the king? Um, the, <coughs> excuse me. They go back and forth, and some of them are like, well, yeah, I think he's still the rightful king. Um, he was just doing what he had to, but yeah, Absalom's dead. He's our king. Let's bring him back. David sends word back to Jerusalem. Remember, he left two of his priests back in Jerusalem to kind of hold down the fort and... Uh, be his eyes and ears on the inside. Zadok and Absalom, uh, not Absalom, um, Abiathar. And so he says, hey, I got guys from Jerusalem out here ready to bring me back into town as a king. What's it with you guys? Why haven't you come out and invited me back yet? Um, he says, you know, I figure you'd be the first ones to say, hey, why don't you come on back uh, and take your rightful place in Jerusalem? Well, David had a way with people. He was a people person. So um, he, he takes to uh, politicking and shaking and kissing babies. And eventually it says he wins the hearts of Judah, of all the people in Judah. And they end up welcoming him back as a king. Now, in chapter 19, verse 16, you remember that old scoundrel named Shimei? You remember that guy? Does that name sound familiar? Well, he was a descendant of Saul's household. And when David had to turn tail and run out of Jerusalem, as he's leaving, um, Shimei sees him coming along the road, and he says, oh, man, this is an awesome opportunity. This is the guy that took down my kinfolk's household. And so he starts to hurl insults on David, and he starts throwing rocks and dirt clods and, and everything at David. And in fact, David's men want to kill him, but David's like, just let him be, you know, I mean, I, I pretty much wiped out his whole household, uh, the household of Saul. He's got a right to be angry, just leave him be. Well, now the times have turned. David is making his way back towards Jerusalem. He gets to the, um, to the Jordan River, and old um, Shimei sees him coming, and he comes to David and falls down prostrate, prostrate before him, and he's like, yeah, I know what you think. I mix those two words up all the time. <laughs> Prostrate. Basically, he's groveling at David's feet. Oh, David. You know, some things were said, King David, in anger. Now, let's, let's, let's just remember that, that things were kind of hot here. And I might have said some things that might have been offensive. Uh, man, please don't hold it against me. Don't cut off my head. David's like, don't worry about it. Get on up. Everything's good. So basically, he asks for forgiveness. He's like, you know, just, just forgive me, king. You know, your servant didn't mean any of those bad things. And David's like, you know what? All's forgiven. Hey, I understand. You know, you, you, you probably had a right to be a little angry. Um, however, one of David's men, uh, Abishai, says, hold on, David. He was cursing the Lord's anointed. You're God's anointed. He shouldn't have been treating you like that. You ought to put him to death. So Abish, um, Abishai calls for his head on a platter, and David says, oh, look, this ain't none of your business. Who am I to kill that guy? He's like, I don't think so. We're not going to bother with him. Just leave it be. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, another name pops up, old machine, Mephibosheth. You guys remember Mephibosheth? That was Saul's grandson, uh, who um, he was lame because of an accident at birth when he was running away from um, David's men. Uh, David had given him all of Saul's property, all the land and everything like that. Um, and we saw him last week. Well, actually, we didn't see him. That was the problem. As David is fleeing Jerusalem, um, Mephibosheth is nowhere to be found. But his servant, Sika, it. Sika comes to David, and David's like, hey, where's Mephibosheth? He's like, uh, yeah, king, he said he wasn't coming. He's just going to hang out in Jerusalem and see which way the political winds go. Well, now we see Mephibosheth coming out to greet King David, and you can imagine how this reunion goes. Mephibosheth shows up and says, oh, King David, man, I'm so glad to see that everything's all right. Glad that you made it. David's like, really? Because when the chips were down, I didn't see him so where were you? He says, well, let me tell you what happened. He said, 
you know I'm lame, you know it takes me a while to get going, I can't use my feet. Well, I had somebody saddle up my donkey, I was gonna get on the donkey, I was gonna come out with you, but my servant Sika, well, he, uh, he betrayed me, and I couldn't come out, and more than that, I know he's been out here spreading lies about me. And David's like, oh, really? He says, I just happened to take everything that I had given to you of Saul's and gave it to him, he says, I'm going to take it and give it back to you. And in fact, what he says is, I want you and Sika to divide the land. Now, if I was King David, I would have stripped everything from Sika, probably made an example of it, and gave it all back to Mephibosheth. But he's like, look, I just want you guys to split up the stuff and, and, and deal with that. Way. Mephibosheth, being a, a humble guy that he is, he's like, you know what, King? I don't even want any of it. I just want to make sure that I'm in your good graces because you have poured out your your grace and your mercy upon me, O oh wise king. You can let that fool have everything. Um, and that's kind of how it is. I, it doesn't really say um, whether he let Sika have everything or whether it was split up. So um, as David is going back, so we, we, we've seen um, Shimei is forgiven. Mephibosheth is restored. Uh, David restores him to his previous place because um, he was mischaracterized. Uh, but we, um, we see another guy named Barz Barzillai that comes out to meet him. Barzillai was a leader. He was an old guy, 80 years old. And he was the leader of the town that David ran to. He was the guy that provided the, the material support for David and his men while they were hiding out. Um, and he comes and David's like, oh, my friend, I'm glad you come. Uh, with, come, come to Jerusalem with me. He said, I want you to come live with me. Man, I'll give you the best of everything. Well, um, this guy goes, you know, that's a mighty tempting offer. He said, man, I'm an old guy. I'm kind of set my ways. I got my home back over here. He said, besides, you know, being so old, am I going to be able to even enjoy all these things that you'll do for me? Um, he says, man, I'm not going to be able to taste how good the food is. I'm not going to be able to taste how, how vintage the wine is. I'm not going to see the beauty of things. He says, I'm just going to go back to my hometown. I, I just want to die in peace over there. He says, but I have a servant here uh, named Kim Han. Why don't you let him go in my place and you can pour all your blessings that you're going to give me. Pour them all Kim Han. David's like, all right, let's do it. And so instead, Kim Han goes um, with King David to receive the gifts that his uh, master Barzillai would have received. Oh, well, when David returns to Judah, the tribes of Israel start to get a little jealous. They're like, hey, why is he going back to Judah? He's our king too, after all. The, the people in Judah is like, yeah, but he comes from the tribe of Judah. He's one of us. And the Israelites are like, well, there's 10 of us tribes. There's only two of you guys. So we kind of have the greater claim here. Um, and so there was some jealousy and some infighting there over whose king he really was. So by this time, everybody, almost everybody, we'll see in a minute, everybody has accepted David as the rightful king of all the um, tribes of Israel, both northern and southern kingdoms. Um, and so they're fighting a little tug of war to see who gets the king, right? Well, the southern tribe of Judah wins the tug of war. Uh, David goes back to Jerusalem. After all, he's already set up his household there. Why would he want to change? Um, chapter 20. There's always one in every group in there. Always one troublemaker that just can't let things be. Well, in this group, it happened to be a guy by the name of Sheba. He was a Benjamite. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. And he rejects David as his king. He says, man, that ain't my king. Um, he said, we have no share in David, no part of Jesse's son, every man to his tent, Israel. So doesn't that sound a lot like what even still happens in politics today? Um, yeah. I mean, ever since I've been old enough to vote, which I'm telling my age a little bit, the first president I was able to vote for was either um, uh, Bush or Gore. Bush or Gore. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Not, not, um, it was uh, the first Bush or Clinton. So yeah, uh, so 90, that was 92, right? Yeah, so that was the first um, election I was old enough to vote in. And for every presidential election since that one, 
whoever won the White House, there was always somebody that I knew that said, that's not my president. I was like, really? I didn't know for was not mine. I said, well, you do understand that's not how politics in this country work, right? Whether you like it or not, that's your president until, you know, he's, he or she's out there. Well, that's what this guy, she was like, I didn't eat my king. I didn't want him. He's out of here. Um, and um, so when he rejects David as king, he calls the other ten tribes of Israel to his cause, uh, and they end up following him. So we just have a story about the ten tribes of the northern tribes fighting wanting him to be their king and go live up there, and now one guy from the tribe of Benjamin says, ah, he ain't no good, sorry, no good King David. Why don't you guys come over here, we'll set up our own king. Boom, off they go. Now we have a little side note in here, and I'm not sure why this is even, it's kind of like a parenthetical story. Um, remember when David left Jerusalem in a hurry, he left behind 10 concubines. Well, that was to fulfill what God had told David would happen uh, because of his sin with Bathsheba, that there was coming a day <coughs> when God will allow David's wives uh, to be defiled, not in secret like he defiled Uriah's wife Bathsheba, but wide open. Well, that happened when his son Absalom came into Jerusalem after him, but it wasn't with David's wives because he didn't leave his wives behind. He left the concubines behind. Well, Absalom made love to all of them, um, which made him despicable in the eyes of his father because of what he had done. Well, now David's back. We still have to deal with these ten concubines and what comes of that. Well, what uh, and, and it doesn't make any sense that the story is in this particular thing. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me. But it's here. So what he does is he takes those ten concubines and sets them, sets them up in a household. Uh, he provides for them as he should, um, although he never, ever had relations with them again. And they died, you know, without him ever going back and having relations with them again. Was there any... Children born to these ten women. That, uh, you know, I'd have to go back and scour through the um, scour through the genealogies. I'm not sure. Right off the top of my head, I don't know. I would say probably. Um, but remember that the Bible is not necessarily a listing of all the facts of what happened. Mm -hmm. It just tells a story. Mm -hmm. So even if there were, if it's not germane to the story, then the biblical writers would have left them out. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we dig through all the genealogies, there might be. What would be, how, how do they determine whether a woman is a wife or a compliment? Another good question. That, that uh, we would have to dig deep into the cultural, um, the, the culture of that time to figure out what, because when we think of, Weddings and wives and husbands today. I mean, we, it's a legalistic system, basically. You know, it, it falls under a legal framework. The government just happens to give us as Christians uh, our own little thing within the framework of what makes a, a wedding, right? But in that particular culture, one of the things that um, if you were even engaged to be married, it was a legal binding contract between woman and man. We see that when we get to the New Testament story of Mary and Joseph, right? They weren't even married yet. And when Mary ends up pregnant, um, I mean, all heck is about to break loose because of this. You know, in our time, we're like, what's the big deal? Yeah, it's a, a, a betrayal, but, you know, there's no legal ramifications because they're not husband and wife yet. Just go your separate ways and be done with it. But in that time, they were considered legally bound together even though they hadn't had the wedding ceremony which is, um, I, I'm guessing, had not changed too much from the culture in place at the time of the Old Testament writing. So I would say probably the actual ceremony itself, which would have um, bestowed upon the woman a legal standing as a wife that a concubine wouldn't have. Things don't change all that much throughout history, right? So let's put that in, a, in today's context. What's the difference between a mistress and a wife? You know, um, for the man, it, it, there's, there's a lot of difference. There's a lot less dreams. We've got a lot more fun on this side. For, you know, we, we think that way. But think about it from the mistress's point of view. She's got no financial stability from 
the man that, that she's sleeping with, uh, like the wife does. So if he decides to kick the mistress to the curb, hey, all she can do is raise a ruckus and maybe cause some problems with the guy's wife. Whereas if he decides he wants to leave his wife, well, he's going to leave his wife with half his stuff, right? That's just how it is. So um, as far as how you decided whether the woman was going to be a concubine in the wife, I don't know. I really hadn't thought that much about it. But that's kind of an interesting thing. Did you have a... No, I was just... Oh, you I've been thinking about that ever since he left the concubines there. I said, why do you determine? You know? Well, I mean, they probably were not considered people that were... I guess you said pre presentable, since they were like mistresses. But the only concubine I can remember that actually there's any documentation of children is Sarah's. Well, there's a lot more than that, but yeah, that, that was. But I mean, it's yeah. actually recognized right. as a lineage. Hagar's. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she wasn't even a concubine, she was actually Sarah's servant, Sarah's slave. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, there, there, there are others in the Bible and they don't pop to mind right now. But they but probably didn't, weren't granted property, were they, as, as the wives? Not usually. Even, you know, even in the case of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, um, one of the problems with um, Ishmael's birth was they took it upon themselves to bring that about when God's like, no, I told you I was going to give you what I wanted you to have when I wanted you to have it. Um, you know, that is your son, but that's not the son I promised to give you. So I'm going to provide for, for Ishmael. Don't worry about him. He's going to be the father of nations. But Isaac is the one. That's the one I'm promising you. And it came through his wife, not an illegitimate um, relationship. So um, I don't, I don't want to put words in God's mouth and say, that God said, well, I'm not going to bless Ishmael because it was a, uh, you know, it wasn't a husband-wife relationship versus this, but it, it could have those implications. But I think it had a lot more to do with than being impatient and doing things their own way. Once again, things don't change all that much. I know when I try to run ahead and do things my own way, they usually don't end up as as well as by just being patient and let God deal with things on God's time. So, um, I rambled a lot, David. Dickie, did I answer your question at all, or did I just muddy the water? <laughs> I, I said a lot of words to say. You know, Dickie, I just don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm sure if I went back and studied some uh, ancient Near East history, I'd probably have some answers for you. If there's anything important that come up. <laughs> well, we would think so, but remember when the biblical authors wrote this, they wrote this with uh, an expectation that the readers at that time, or the hearers at the time, they would have known certain things that we just don't know mm -hmm. without some real deep dive study. So uh, that's why some things would have been obvious to the original audience that we have to dig for, and this might be one of them where, you know, that might be important if, you know, if we actually knew it, it would open up... Oh, I just got to go on a tangent. I just got to tell you, that's the beautiful thing about the Bible. To steal a line from Shrek, um, the Bible is like an onion. No, it's not stinky. It's got layers. And the more we know about the period of time that it was set in and those people and, and how they did things, the more the layers open up. I mean, I mean, the outside, well, you take the skin off an onion and throw it away. But that first layer, I mean, that's good. You make a good uh, relish with it, but... As you get into the onion, you see it's got so much more in it. It's the same thing with the Bible. So that might be something good for some in-depth study. I might, I might take that on one day. It's a good question. I've never, never considered it. Um, so anyway, I had a side note about the ten concubines. Um, David asked uh, a guy named Amasa to go out. He sends him out to muster up an army to go fight against Sheba. He says, you know, we need to deal with this guy, Sheba. This is not going to be well. If we, just, if we just let this stand, this is not going to be good. So he's like, you got three days. Go and muster up the men of Judah. Come back here in three days. Well, he takes longer than three days. So David is sitting around twiddling some. He's like, look, I can't wait any longer. If we let this go any longer, I mean, this, this guy, Sheba, is going to end up being a bigger thorn on our side than even Absalom was. He says, hey, Joab. Joab, go out and... Um, um, I want you to go out and pursue Sheba. Take some, some men and go out after them. 
So Joab does, and along the way, Joab and Amasa meet up. I'm not sure how they ended up meeting up, but they do. Um, Amasa comes up and says, hey, Joab, fancy meeting you out here. What's going on? He's like, oh, man, you know, we're just out for a little, little hike. Uh, come here, man. I want to give you a proper greeting. Now, the author of, of the book is telling us, like, hey, guys, watch this. Old Joab's got a, uh, he, he's got a dagger hidden in a, in a sheath under his, his robe. And when he leans forward, it'll fall out. Well, he doesn't mean fall out on the ground. He means fall out into his hand. And so um, Amasa comes up to Joab, and Joab reaches up. And I'm guessing this is a cultural thing, because if somebody reached up and grabbed me by the beard, I'd probably slap him. But he reaches up with his right hand grabs him by the beard to bring him in to give him a, a, a kiss, which would have been a, a standard greeting. He does that with the right hand. Well, you got to watch what the left hand's doing because he's leaned forward, that thing slid out of his hand, and he stabs him right in the gut. Now, this is not the first time we've seen somebody stabbed in the belly of the trade. He said, he didn't even have to stab him again. He got such a good shot in with the first one. He falls right there, and he dies right there in the middle of the road. Um, <coughs> he got him in the fifth rib. I must have got him right there in the fifth room. Yeah, I was to the ground. Yep. Um, and so Joab and Abishai take off with the troops after sheep. He's like, all right, we got rid of this dude. Um, let, let's go after the main character. So they're, they're on the road. They're going after Sheba. But Amasa is laying in the middle of the road. And he's quite, uh, creating quite the spectacle. Everybody that comes by is stopping to look at him and gawk at him. And one of the guys are like, we can't just leave him laying here because he's just holding up track, you know. So they, like a deer in the road, is holding up track. They drag him out of the road over to the field. And they throw a cloak over him, cover him up. That way people aren't looky-looing and rubbernecking. And so they get on down the road where they can get to the fighting. Um, meanwhile, Sheba, he's uh, traveling along through, um, through the territory, going from town to town. He's getting quite a following. Um... He's got a lot of people that's back. Well, they end up in this town. He takes refuge in a town called Abel Beth Makkah. Uh, Joab finds out he's there, and so Joab and his army go up there, and they lay siege to the town. So they, they set up uh, a siege ramp, and they start battering the walls, and they can't quite get through. But all this is going on, and this one little old lady, the Bible says she's a wise woman, she goes to the top of the city wall, and she goes, Hey, aren't you Joab? He said, yeah, what about? Well, hey, I, I want to talk to you. I've got a message for you. What do you want? She goes, we're a peaceful town. We're known throughout the land as the mother of Israel. Why are you here quarreling with us? Why are you wanting to destroy us? Joab says, well, hold on. Far be it for me to do that. I don't want to destroy this town. But we have this little matter of a guy named Sheba. He come to your town. And, you know, he is, he is guilty of uh, insurrection against the king. And all we want is Sheba. You give us Sheba, we walk away and we don't harm your town. The wise woman says, ah, oh, that's all you want? I'm sure we can arrange that. Tell you what, we'll chuck his head down to you from the top of the wall. So she goes in and starts talking to the leaders of the town and she convinces them of the wisdom she goes look if we don't give up this guy Sheba our whole town is going to be destroyed I say we kill the dude cut off his head and chuck it over the wall like I promised the leaders of the town says you know what I don't see any better options so let's do it so they kill the guy cut off his head and she chucks it over the wall um, and Joab takes it and heads back to Jerusalem mission accomplished he's done um, after that, uh, let's see, she brought up David. I run ahead of myself. Um, after that, um, there comes a time where the nation of Israel falls under a famine. For three years, there is famine in the land. So David does what David does well. He goes and seeks out the face of the Lord. He said, God, why are we starving to death here? Why can't our corn grow and our barley come to, come to a harvest? Uh, God says, you know what, David? I'm going to tell you why. You remember uh, your predecessor, Saul? Well, he broke a vow. You see, way back when, when Joshua came across, and you guys remember this story, 
Way back when, when Joshua crossed into the promised land, and I told him, I told you guys, don't make a treaty with anybody. These are the people you're supposed to completely wipe out. All the people in this close area, wipe them out completely. Kill everything that moves. Y'all remember this, right? If you don't remember, Miss Paula had a connection that night about all the killing and, and all that. He says, I don't want you to leave any of them alive. Um, don't make a treaty with any of them. Kill them all. He said, now, the people from far away, if you want to make a treaty with them, fine, but they'll just have to be subject as your servants, uh, as slaves to you. But the people close by, don't make a treaty. Well, this group of people called the Gibeonites, which were part of the people that were supposed to be completely annihilated, they come up with this ruse, and they said, you know what, we're going to make it look like we've been on a long journey. You know, we're going to pack up some moldy bread, some old wine and wine skins, and convince the, uh, this invading army that we come from far away that they can make a treaty. Well, without inquiring of the Lord, um, they made a treaty with the Gibeonites. Well, even though that wasn't God's plan, God's like, look, you made the treaty with them, you've got to be bound by that. And so up until the time of Saul, the Gibeonites had been provided for and had not been annihilated. Well, Saul, in his zeal, went out and he tried to annihilate them. Broke that covenant, which I think we talked about a few weeks back, maybe a month or two back. Um, and because he broke that, that treaty, that covenant, God is now going to hold them accountable and responsible for it. Remember, God doesn't always deal with things right when it happens. Sometimes, like the poor fellow that reached up to catch the ark when it stumbled, he'll strike you dead right there when you do something wrong. Sometimes, he just kind of stews on it, and he waits for the right time to punish you. So Saul had done this a while back. God's just getting around to punish him, and he sends famine on the, uh, <coughs> famine on the land for three years. Um, so David says, well, if that's all it is, I think uh, we can probably make some amendments. So he reaches out to the Gibeonites and says, you know what, Saul did an evil thing. Um, but you know Saul's gone. What can we do to make amends? Ask, and it shall be done for you. And they're like, well, you know, we're just, we're just some humble people. We don't even deserve to be considered in the king's eyes. But I'll tell you what. Give us seven of Saul's male uh, descendants to where we can kill them and expose their bodies before the Lord. And we'll call it evil. Um, David says, hmm. All right, I guess we can do that. Now, remember, one of Saul's descendants is old Mephibosheth, which he's kind of got a soft spot for because it's uh, Jonathan, his best friend Jonathan's son. Um, he spares Mephibosheth, but he ends up turning seven others over to him. The Gibeonites kill him, and they expose their bodies on a hill before the Lord. Um, and eventually God, uh, well, eventually we'll get there in a minute, but God uh, will end the famine in the land. Everything's even Stephen at that point. Meanwhile, <coughs> these seven men have been killed. Uh, one of Saul's concubines named Rizpah hears about it. She takes and lays some sackcloth on the ground, and she sits there and guards the body. She won't let the birds or the wild animals get those bodies from the time when the barley harvest started, which is when they were killed, until the time the rains came. Now, I don't know how long that is, but I'm guessing it was a, a, a fair piece of time that she stood there and faithfully guarded those bodies uh, and she really didn't even have to. I mean, she, well, it wasn't like she was family. She was just a concubine to Saul. Um, David hears of this faithfulness and says, you know what? I've got to do something to reward that. Um, up to this point, Saul and David's, well, all that's left is their bones. Um, they are interred in a town in that area, which is not their hometown. So David says, I think we'll just um, dig up their bones and we're going to bring them back to the family tomb and we'll rebury them there. And so he gets David and, and, or excuse me, Saul and Jonathan's bones, brings them back to Saul's hometown um, and has them reburied in the tomb of their ancestors. And then God answered David's prayers to end the famine in the land. And all was good. In chapter, second part of chapter 21, there is a series of four battles. Um, so the Philistines are stirring up trouble again for Israel. There's been a little bit of peace. But now they're stirring up trouble again. So Israel fights a series of four battles against the um, of Philistines. The first one, David goes out with his troops to do battle. Now I'm not saying David is old, but he's probably a little bit long in the tooth when you look at this battle. Because he goes out 
and he just gets wore out. He gets tired, and his men have to come to his rescue. He's about to be killed. And his men's like, hey, king, I'll tell you what, man, you're way too valuable for us, uh, to us to be doing battle out here with us. We, can, we can't, we couldn't stand to lose you. King, why don't you stay in the rear with the gear and let us do the fighting? And so that's what David ends up doing. He stays back for the next three battles. And um, so they fight these series of battles. Um, um, and one of the battles, uh, Goliath, you remember Goliath? His brother is killed by one of the Israelites. So Goliath was killed by David here sometime later. Um, one of David's men kills Goliath's brother. Um, and in another battle, they fought against this giant that had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot for a total of 24 fingers and toes. I can just imagine. First of all, he's a giant, and then he's just, he's a freak of nature with all these fingers and toes. I mean, it's crazy. Um, and David's nephew, Jonathan, ends up killing this guy. In all, four different descendants of Rapha, which was the, the family line that uh, Goliath came from, died in this battle, one in each one of these battles. Now, I'm sure there's a special meaning for the story being kind of put in here. There's probably a the theological meaning or something that y'all wants to, I really don't know what it is, but it's a great story. Um, in chapter 22, and I'm not going to go through it with you, but David gives a psalm of thanksgiving, or he, he, he gives us a, a song of praise for God's protection. So he sings a song of praise because God has delivered him from Saul and from all the enemies around him. And so he sings this 51 verse song to God. Beginning of chapter 23, um, is a poetic record of David's last words. Now, it's kind of weird <coughs> how this story of David's last words is placed where it's at because we would expect the way we write, you know, if you were writing a story and you wrote about me and you wrote my last words, what would be the next part of your story? You're counting how I die, right? Well, we have David's last words here. Now, I'm reading on, it's like, okay, you know, now we we'll get to David's death and it's like, Okay, David's not dead. And then I turn the page and I'm like, wait a second, David's not dead yet. So we have a record of his last words. Then um, the next part of chapter 23 is a listing of all the best men in David's army. So kind of the writer is kind of tying up some loose ends here, getting everything uh, ready to wrap up his story uh, of David. It's not the end of David's story. We get to chapter 24. And, um, and this, is, this is interesting. So chapter 24, it says, verse 1, And again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. <coughs> okay, so God tells him to go take a census. Except David goes to take a census, and God gets mad and decides to punish David for it. Well, if you look in some of your Bibles, it'll have a note. Um, that'll give you a hyperlink to another part of the Bible where this story is, uh, same story is told just from a different point of view. If you go to 1 Chronicles um, chapter 21, verse 1, we see this story again. And I'm going to read to you what, what it says over in 1 Chronicles. As soon as I can find it. 1 Chronicles, it's after Kings. There we go. 1 Chronicles chapter 21. So, in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, it says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take the census of Israel. I don't know if maybe the translators kind of missed something in the Hebrew of 2 Samuel and attributed it something to God where the chronicler attributes it to Satan. Given the context of what we're about to see happen, I'm going to say... It was Satan that incited David, not God. Because if God says, hey, go do this, and you go do it, usually he's not going to then punish you for doing what he just told you to do. Although we saw that with Balaam when God told him to go to, to Balak and, and to prophesy over Israel, and he gets on his talking donkey. Remember that story, right? And he's riding, and the donkey sees this angel that Balaam doesn't. And, you know, God's going to kill Balaam for going where God told me to go. So it's not without precedent, but I think here that 
given the other evidence we have, it's probably Satan that told him this. So, <clears throat> so somebody told David to go take a census. Um, and so David tells Joab and the army commanders, he said, go throughout all the tribes of Israel um, and enroll all the fighting men. I want to know how many fighting men we got. Um, Joab says, King, I, I don't know about this plan. I don't think this is a good plan. David says, who's the king, you or me? Well, mm -hmm. king, I think you're the king. Well, then you might want to get to count some people. So in other words, Joab was overruled. The king's word stood. In fact, well, let's see. Um, the king's word, however, overruled Joab and the army commanders, so they left the presence of the king to enroll the fighting men of Israel. So they go out. <coughs> it takes them nine months and 20 days to complete the census. And they come back, and Joab says, all right, so here's, here's the results. In Israel, there's 800 warriors capable of swinging a sword. And in Judah, there's 500,000. So we've got 800,000 in the northern kingdom, 500,000 in the southern kingdom. Um, immediately, almost immediately, according to the Bible, David regrets having taken a census. He knew that he had done something he wasn't supposed to do. Uh, and he goes to God and he asks for forgiveness. Now, God is a good and a forgiving God, but sometimes, um, just like with parents, uh, when our kids make a mistake, we forgive them, but there's got to be a price to be paid, right? So God's like, look, and this is a good God. And I model, uh, I try to model my parenting after God. I always give my kids choices. I do. I say, look, here's the choice. You can do what I say, or you can take a whooping, and you can do what I say. But God is even more gracious than this. God is even more gracious than this. God's like, I tell you what, there's going to be punishment, but I'm going to give you three options, and you pick which one, David, whichever one you think's best. Um, so he sends word through his prophet named Gad, and he says, go tell David that these are three choices. So Gad goes and says, God says, here's your three choices. You can either A, have three years of famine in the land. Now remember, they're just coming out of three years of famine. He said, you can have three years of famine in the land, or you can have three months of having to flee from your enemies, or you can have three days where I'll send plague in the land. And whenever we see the word plague in the Bible, usually it means death and destruction coming, right? Um, so the prophet tells um, David, he's like, think it over and tell me how I should go and answer the one who sent you these choices. So David thinks it over and he says, you know what? He says, um, I don't want to be, um, he says, I, I want the Lord to judge me. I don't want to be, find judgment at the hand of my enemies because God will show me mercy. So God takes that as, okay, that must be choice number three. So God sends a, um, a plague and the plague kills 70,000 people from Dan to Beersheba. So they're working their way. Dan is way up north. The plague is working its way south over these three days, coming south. Um, and the angel that, um, that is doing God's will here, the angel is the one that's uh, perpetuating this plague. The angel is just about ready to reach out and strike Jerusalem. And God's like, all right, that's enough. The angel like, I still got Jerusalem to go. I have relented. I said that's enough. And so God stopped uh, the angel. And the angel is right at, and if I remember right now, don't hold me to this. I'm going to tell you something, but I'm telling you like kind of Paul did in one of his letters. This is not God speaking. This is your pastor speaking from memory, which is maybe wrong. That probably is wrong. The angel gets to this certain place right at the cusp of Jerusalem. He, the angel is at a threshing floor of a guy named Aranua, the Jebusite. I believe, if I'm correct, that that place was on the Temple Mount, which ultimately becomes the place where Solomon will build the temple to, uh, to God. Because up to this point, there's no temple. God's still um, kind of moving from place to place under a tent, right? Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that that threshing floor ends up being on the Temple Mount. But anyway, the angel stops there. Um, David sees the angel, and he pleads with God. He says, God, what have these people done? It was I that made a mistake. Why are these people suffering for the mistake I made? Take me and leave the people be. Well, God doesn't take David. He relents and everything. Um, 
But God decides, or excuse me, David decides to offer a sacrifice to the Lord to, to stop the plague. So he, um, God, or excuse me, Gad, which is the prophet that God uses, he says, God wants you to build an altar. Go back up to that threshing floor where you saw that angel. Go up to the Jebusites and, and threshing floor and build an altar and make an offering. So David goes to the threshing floor. The Jebusite sees him and he comes out and he's like, Sorry. Now, remember the Jebusites, they are descendants from the Amorites. So they're not Israelites. In fact, they're the people, they're not even supposed to be there. They're supposed to be completely eradicated. But the Jebusites are still there. They couldn't quite drive them all out. Um, but this guy, he, he's, he knows that David's king. He's like, King, why do you honor me coming here? What can I do for you? David says, I need your threshing floor and I want to buy it from you because I need to build an offer to make uh, an altar to make an offering to God so he'll relent from this plague. Oh, king, I couldn't take your money. Just take it. He says, not only do you get this thresh, this fine threshing floor here, I'm going to give you the oxen that you need to make the sacrifice. And I want you to have my wood-handled tools to use as firewood mm -hmm. to make the offering. It's all yours, king. Just take whatever you need. David's like, nope, can't do that. He said, first of all, I, I wouldn't take anything from you because that's not the right. I've got to pay for it. Besides, I would never think of making an offering to God that didn't cost me something. So he ends up paying him, I think, 50 shekels of um, silver. 50 shekels yeah. of silver. Um, and he buys the threshing floor and the oxen. Um, and he builds the altar, makes a sacrifice of burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. And then the Lord answered his prayer in behalf of the land and the plague on the Israel was stopped. Well, that brings us up um, through the end of 1st and 2nd Samuel. Um, next week we'll go into Kings, but before we do that, we've got a little bit of time, and I just want to ask a, you know, a few questions for discussion to kind of get, get y'all's take on what we have just seen about the story of David. Um, I'm just going to throw a softball, lob it out here, and let you take a good swing at it. Um, first question I have is, what are, what are some of the positives and negatives that we find in the character of King David? What are some of his positive and negative traits? That's a good per people person. Oh yeah, he, he really, yeah, he, he got people behind him, didn't he? And that's a good trait for you. I think he puts people above God a lot. Puts people above God. Say more about that. I, I think it shows that he's, he thinks he's doing the best for the people that he's serving, but he often forgets to consult God first. Ah, mm -hmm. there are times when you do see that, yeah, that's a great insight. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, he puts the welfare of his people above what God's will is from time to time. I think that's a good insight. Um, that would be a negative one. And of course, there's that whole Bathsheba thing. I mean, we can't just gloss over that. He's a man after God's own heart, but he's a man after all. So he's sinful by nature. So. Um, we might have discussed this already. I can't remember if it was us or North that did. So if we've discussed it, just let me know what y'all came up with. That's me this time. I was going to say Lord. Um, <laughs> no, that's Nobody ever calls that's, no, that's, that's my kid trying to get away. I get mad. So why does David seemingly seemingly get by with what others are punished harshly for? And I'm thinking in my mind the correlation between Saul and David, where Saul does things and he is spanked hard by God, and David does things that in our minds are even worse. But he seems, he, I mean, he's punished, but he comes out okay on the other side. Did we discuss that? I don't think David no, we haven't. I don't think David really has the um, same thought process as Saul. Saul was kind of nuts and he was so paranoid about David taking over. Oh yeah. Because David was not worried about people overtaking him. Huh. I don't know. Interesting. I think that he you know, he just made some decisions as a weak person at times. He did, but I will push back a little bit on he was worried about people overtaking him, or else he wouldn't have hightailed it when Absalom was trying to kill him. This is, well, that's true, but I, I don't think that, I think that that was probably a little different perspective than what Saul was. Saul was agree. so paranoid about everything. Mm -hmm. and, um, I would agree. How about heart condition? When Saul messed up, what did he do? Blamed other people. Blamed other people, made excuses. Samuel, it's your fault that I had to offer the sacrifice because you weren't here when you were supposed to. You know, 
I'm going after David because David's trying to steal this thing away. You know, he was always blaming other people. What did David do when he made a mistake and was found out or challenged on it? He usually tried to make some sort of uh, change to he acknowledged it. And he acknowledged it, he owned it. God, yeah, he asked God to, to help him with decisions. He repented, right. Well, look at Bathsheba. He thought that he got away with something. Nobody knew what he had done until God spoke to Nathan. And Nathan went and told him a story about a little baby lamb. I think I preached on that a couple of weeks ago. And the king's like, oh, that guy's evil, man. he got to be put to death. He's got to pay back. And Nathan's like, Phew. King, that guy's you. And then what he did, he didn't like, well, that's totally different. No, he's like, oh, oh my God, I see what you're saying. I made a mistake. Lord, have mercy on me. David had a repentant heart. When he did wrong, he knew he did wrong. He took the census when he wasn't supposed to. Immediately, he knew he had done wrong. He turned to God. He said, man, I'm sorry. There was something about that in here that's, you know, um, it says that one of the things they thought could have been an issue with that was that the census was usually reserved for people that were pure before they went to battle. These people have already been in battle. Hmm. I hate so. to consider that. But, I, uh, yes, sorry. Uh, I don't want to cut short of thought going, but uh, you know, the, the old saying is we judge others by their actions, we judge ourselves by our intentions. intentions. Yes, I wonder you. if, you know, God that has made a creation to have fellowship with if he, he's able to see within the intention level of David more than we're actually seeing as opposed to actions. I wonder, I wonder if it's even fair to put that towards God. Wow. No, well, God knows our heart. He knows our innermost parts, right? Um, but maybe the intentions outweigh the actions on a level that we don't really... It might. Um, now, you know, a popular saying amongst a lot of Christians is the road to hell is paved with... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can you show me that in the Bible? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, we say a lot of say, here's another one. Cleanliness is next to godliness. A lot of people think that's in the Bible, but <laughs> I've never seen that in the Bible anywhere. Um, yeah, he, he might actually, you know, I'm sure he judges our actions. James speaks pretty clearly about, you know, being people of action, you know, be doers of the word, not hearers of the word. But, you know, sometimes I guess our intentions can be valuable in as much as we really would have cared about if we'd have had the ability to. I wonder if the writer's even writing something that people would have known that we don't know about the intentions rather than the actions. Hmm. I mean, you know, we're kind of going back to that all of a sudden. But, but uh, I mean, it does, I agree with you, it doesn't look fair sometimes that people get by with stuff other people don't know. And, I mean, maybe we're not to be looking at fair, maybe it's not a Judge Judy episode, maybe this is a Something higher. How many of us in here have more than one child? We got two or more children. So a lot of us, right? And you're not an only child, so I know you have fallen victim to this. How many times have one of our kids looked at what another one of our children have got, or you looked at what your sister got, or she's looked at what you got? Well, that's not fair. What's our standard parent response? Well, that's, that's not, not fair. fair. <laughs> and in fact, that's just a short circuit to end the argument. But in our hearts, we truly know that what we have done is fair because we have a reason most, most likely for it that the child is not, they don't understand or not privy to, you know. Um, how much more so than with God when we think, well, that's not fair. David got away with murder and Saul, all he was trying to do was just offer up some... So look at the God that stayed in the ark. Oh, man, that's still not fair. I, you'll never convince me that's right. God might one day, but you won't. I promise you. And, and another saying, it's not about me. I never get what I deserve. <laughs> Most people always want what they deserve until they step very closely. Until they see what, they're, what they deserve. And they're like, there's a guy. Yeah. Um, last question for consideration. Uh, a multi-point question. But given that, and, and, and I'm just stipulating here, and you don't have to agree with this, but this is how I look at the Bible. And, and I stole it from people smarter than I. That the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. If we look at the Bible through that lens, that worldview, that it's a, a unified story that points to Jesus, how does David's story, the one we just come through in First and Second Samuel, how does that move us closer to Jesus? 
what about that story can we hang our hat on that points to Jesus? And honestly, I didn't have enough time to consider it to actually have a good answer for you. I was hoping y'all had one for me. <laughs> I'm telling you, y'all think I come here to give you stuff. I come to hear what you have to say a lot of times because I, I need answers too. Well, every time that David did something to record it, Well, you might be punished. But you'll be forgiven still. But there is forgiveness. I think that's it for me. David was a great example that even a man after God's own heart, even a person after God's own heart, was still a fallible human being, right? Still made mistakes. But that with the right heart, that there was still forgiveness available. And he couldn't build a temple because God needed a, he didn't want a warrior. Right. I mean, I mean, he had too all, much blood on his hands. There's also that transition still has to happen. Jesus would fulfill the whole story. Right. Yeah. So, so David's part of the story is just a small part. Yeah. But it plays an oversized role as it points to Jesus. And these are some of the things. Yeah. That's a great insight. Um, to me, it looks like David, it's kind of unfair to people that have to reap the benefit of David's sins. And that brings me back to Jesus. It's really up here to lead with the benefits of our sins. Wow, that is powerful. Um, you're right. And see, as I was reading this story today, as preparing for here, I was looking at it as like 70,000 people died because David made a choice to make a census he didn't have a right to. Where's the fairness in that? But thank you so much for connecting that hyperlink to Jesus. Um, the death he died and everything he went through, how unfair was it because... Somebody before him had made the mistake, mm -hmm. and somebody after him, namely me, had made a mistake that caused him to have to die. Man, I'm glad life's not fair. I really do. Um, how does, um, or does it matter? You remember God made a promise to David that there would always be a ruler from the line of David on the throne for all time. Um, does it matter um, that God promises that? And how does that... Um, how does Jesus figure into that promise? He is considered in the descendants. He is a descendant of David. Yeah, in the line of David. He's so, the and, yeah. So David is actually the precursor, the 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 Jesus 1.0, as it were, um, in that line at least to Jesus. But yeah. So David, or God makes David a promise. That Jesus is ultimately the fulfillment of. Now, of course, a lot of Jews will tell you today, well, where's the Davidic ruler right now? Where's the Davidic king? Well, we Christians, he's on the throne right now, waiting for his second coming. You know, he's still on the throne. So, well, what did y'all think of the story of David? It's not quite over yet. We'll get into a little bit. We'll, we'll see him come to his timely end next week. But, good story so far? Man, that guy did a lot of stuff. It's a hard story for me. It always has been that the man after God's own heart could do so much stuff. It was not good. Not good. No. I mean, he was a sinful man. Well, that kind of gives us hope. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. None of us are perfect. Hopefully, not an excuse. So. <laughs> yeah, not an excuse, but hope. So. Well, folks, that's all I got. Our time is up. I want to be a good steward of all of our time, especially since it's pitch black dark now. And some of us have got to drive home in that. Well, we, we have experienced. Uh, coming here at 6 o'clock on our new time. Do, does anybody think we need to change it to 5? I think so. I would like to do 5, but I don't know. It might be too tight on everybody else since you're not doing the Tuesday morning one anymore. Well, 5 o'clock suits me. Five Is it? Suits me. So, rather than raise your hand, just are there any objections? To move it to five o'clock to where we still got some daylight to drive in. Well, it won't be as late. All right, well, at five o'clock suits. Yeah. Now, in a month, <laughs> we might move to four. Look, folks, I'm going to tell you, I'm nothing if not flexible. Uh, I will meet whatever you guys want. But for now, I bid you to go for the peace. 
Hey folks, remember to click the subscribe button below and ring the bell to be notified when we post new content. And as always, if today's video touched you in some way, please hit the thumbs up button and leave us a comment. We love to hear how our content impacts your walk with Jesus Christ. Until next time, God bless.